I always counted the privilege to introduce to you Brother Doug McClish. I've said this, I guess, on other times that I've had the occasion to, uh, to introduce him back years ago, and I'm not sure how long ago it was, David. It had to be prior to 94 when Brother Al Brown came here. And, uh, you know, we didn't know what a lectureship was. And one of the uh, conditions that Al made to us when he decided to come here was that he had, I'm not sure, I don't remember whether it was two lectureships or at least one lectureship a year that he could attend. And uh, he would come back all charged up and fired up and and we kind of got the idea that this must be a pretty good thing. But one of the things we did notice, he'd come back and he was always saying, well, Brother Dub said this and Brother Dub said that. Said, Who is Brother Dub? Well, luckily we found out. And uh, we've had the privilege of having Brother Dub McClish with us for most of those years. I don't know that you've missed a one, have you, Dub? I, I don't think so, but uh, we, uh, we are sure privileged to have him with us. He is a native Texan, son of a gospel preacher, son-in-law of a gospel preacher, father of a gospel preacher, grandson of an elder. His good wife, LaVon, uh, was a native Tennessean, and uh, I was going to say he, he persuaded her to come to Texas, but there's a lot of places you persuaded her to go with you, didn't you? <laughs> I'm not going to read all of these. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> and uh, I notice, uh, Dub, if you keep on this, this uh, to, to keep it all, we're going to have to get a smaller font. <laughs> all I can say is uh, he preaches the word and he lives the word and he's a fine gospel preacher. So, Dub, come speak to us. There's still some people who say, who is Dub? <laughs> I was telling Rick Ritter, who rode down with me uh, from his home in Stillwell, Oklahoma, where he preaches, about an incident a few years ago in Denton, after I had quit preaching there at Denton, but we were still members there. And uh, the preacher they had employed to follow me uh, had some visitors that day from uh, Oklahoma. He was in Oklahoma. And LaVon and I were out in the foyer introducing ourselves to them. And I said, I'm Dub McClish. This is my wife, LaVon. He said, Dub McClish. I said, hmm, Dub McClish. I said, didn't you used to be a preacher? <laughs> I said, you got me pegged. <laughs> So uh, I, I appreciate uh, you asking that question of Al. We always enjoyed having Al at Denton. Well, it's a joy to be back here again. I always enjoy coming to spring. Uh, I think the years that I missed speaking on this lectureship were the years that I was editing Gospel Journal, and I simply had to cut my back my schedule back some during those years, and uh, was not able to come. But you certainly were. Uh, of great interest to me and in my prayers in your efforts here. I have much material to cover and I want to uh, say at the very beginning that uh, most of you will probably not hear a thing new from me tonight. Uh, my subject doesn't lend itself to, to anything new. My subject demands that I speak on things that are old and so you will just have to pardon if you already know these, if they're ABCs to you, and uh, go ahead and take a refresher course anyway. We're talking this week about things that are necessary for a Christian to be faithful to the Lord. And my first assignment has to do with knowing the difference between the Lord's church and the religions of men. <clears throat> and this is a subject that could easily be expanded into a book, but um, it's a subject that we can see some basic principles concerning that surely will uh, stabilize, strengthen, 
our faith. As we look at the title, we see the Lord's Church. The Lord, of course, is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Lord's Church, that church, the institution that he promised to build in Matthew 16, verse 18, upon the fact that he was the Son of God, as Peter had just confessed him. The Lord's Church, as opposed to the religions of men, the religions of men are many and varied. They involve the paganism, various pagan religions of the world that have no basis in the true and living God. They involve the multitude of variegated uh, versions of quote unquote Christianity that have produced denominationalism with all of the things that make them different from the Lord's church and from one another. And then the phrase, the Lord's church is different from the religions of men. Indeed, there is a great divide between all of the counterfeits and competitors with the Lord's true religion established through his son. And uh, we're going to be giving most of our attention tonight not to the differences between the Lord's church and the pagan religions, though those are many, but between the Lord's church and what we commonly call denominationalism. Various internet sources give figures ranging from 34,000 to 40,000 for the number of distinct denominations claiming in one degree or another to believe in Jesus Christ. Now that's not that many different buildings with a denominational name on them that belong many of them, hundreds or thousands of them to one denomination. That's different denominations. And the differences between the Lord's church and that sort of approach to Christianity are many indeed. The failure to recognize the essentiality of the principles that we're going to study because we cannot get into much detail with all of these differences, as you can imagine. But the principles that we're going to look at will apply to and have their implications concerning all of these thousands of denominational groups. And they will apply as well to those religious bodies that falsely still label themselves churches of Christ. It's not in our purview to establish the fact that the Lord and his apostles established the church that he promised to establish. It's not in our purview to establish the fact that he intended for his church to remain as it was as he established it through his inspired men. The numerous warnings not to tamper with the word of God, the numerous exhortations to be faithful to the word of God, the several statements that explicitly indicate to us that we are to remain faithful to the word and therefore keep his church faithful as he gave it to mankind upon this earth all say that he does not want his church to be changed. When he gave the commission through Matthew, he closed the commission by saying that as the apostles went out and did his work, he would be with them even unto the end of the world. That means he does not want his church changed in any way as long as this world stands. The following principles distinguish the church in the first century from the religions extant at the time the church was established. The paganism of Egypt, the paganism of the Greeks, the paganism of the Persians, and all the other pagan religions of that era. And these same principles remain in force and will continue to draw the differential line between the church of, Lord, of the Lord and all of its counterfeits in paganism. But they particularly will continue to draw that line between the church and all of the denominational scheme. So principle number one, respect for the absolute authority of Jesus Christ is necessary for us to understand the distinction between the Lord's church and the religions of men. 
When the Apostle Paul, or Apostle Thomas, exclaimed, My Lord and my God, as he was with the apostles after the Lord's resurrection, John 20 and verse 28, he employed an authoritative term, translated Lord, that appears almost 250 times in the New Testament in reference to Christ himself. He is the ruler, the master, the one to whom men owe their submission. He has the right to rule. That is involved in this term, Lord. Jesus did not perform his mighty works and wonders and signs to which Peter referred in Acts 2 and verse 22, primarily to relieve human misery, though he did so on a huge scale. John assigns the principal reason for writing his gospel account in John 20, verses 30 and 31. Many other signs, therefore, did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Now, if merely the record of Jesus' miracles was for the purpose of creating faith in his divine sonship and by implication in his lordship and authority, then surely the miracles themselves had the very same primary purpose, to establish who he was, that he was who he said he was, he could do what he said he could do. Immediately before his ascension, Jesus claimed that his father had given him all authority, the American Standard Version reads, in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, verse 18. A millennium before Jesus' birth, David prophesied in the 110th Psalm, Jehovah saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. This passage is the most frequently Old Testament passage quoted either in full or in part in all of the New Testament. It appears time and time again indicating the essentiality of our understanding its meaning that the Lord would be but now is enthroned at the right hand of his father. And Peter made that plain on Pentecost. After quoting David's prophecy, he then drew the conclusion, Acts 2 and verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. While his authority is universal, it particularly applies to his church. Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, of the incomparable power God gave his son when he raised him from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. As the builder and owner, he purchased it with the awful price of his blood, Acts 20 and 28. He has absolute authority over the church. I read a story many, many years ago that I think uh, is an apt illustration just here. It seems a young man had a hobby of building model airplanes. And he had one that was a special prize. He was out flying it one day, and he lost control of it and it disappeared in the woods and he never could find it. Until a few days later, he was walking down the main street of his town and there in the window of a toy shop was his model airplane. He immediately went in and asked how much it cost. He was told, he went home, he broke his piggy bank, he got together every penny he could, just barely had enough money to come back and purchase that plane. And he was heard as he walked out the store saying, First I made you, and now I bought you. That's what the Lord did for his church. He made it, he built it, and then he bought it with the price of his very blood. Since his ascension and heavenly enthronement, he's reigned over his kingdom, which is a figure for the church, as we know from the New Testament. This authority means that Jesus, the Christ alone, has the right to determine every feature, every facet of the church. Man has no right to question it. Man has no right to change it. 
Respect for Jesus' absolute authority is patently absent in the religions of men. That's why they are the religions of men and not the religion of Christ. This includes the denominations that are filled with professed believers in him. They give lip service to his authority. But when their unauthorized practices and false doctrines are challenged, they invariably revert to their threadbare slogans. Doctrine doesn't matter. We can't all agree. All of the churches get their doctrine out of the Bible. That's just your interpretation. We're all going to heaven. We're just traveling different roads are the real clincher. It makes no difference what you believe as long as you're sincere, which is actually a precursor of postmodernism. All such banalities are but advertisements of failure to submit to the Lord they profess to serve. That same Lord made it unmistakably clear what the fate of all such will be. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. And to all such he asks the piercing question, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6 and verse 46. Failure to honor or rebellion at the authority of Christ is the fundamental difference between the Lord's faithful church and every other religious body, including apostate so-called churches of Christ. It is for lack of this crucial commitment to the authority of the Christ that men go astray in their endless varieties of religion. This fact is no less true of errant brethren who've led hundreds of congregations into quasi, if not full, denominational status in the past 30 or 40 years. All such have abandoned the apostolic precept that will keep the Lord's church just that, the Lord's church. And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of by the authority of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, Colossians 3, 17. So principle number one by which we may distinguish between the Lord's church and all the religions of men is respect for the absolute authority of the Son of God. Principle number two flows from number one. That is recognition that the Christ exercises his authority only through the New Testament. Those who truly honor the absolute authority of Jesus Christ understand that he exercises his authority through no other means. The Lord's church has continued <clears throat> to exist since its inception only because godly men and women have sought authority from the New Testament for all that they do in their attempts to serve God whether in the assembly of the saints or whether in their daily lives in every way through the church. When the Lord preferred, uh, referred to those who believe in him but refused to do his will, he spoke of those who do not the things which I say, Luke 6, 46, as we've just noticed. So he indicates that he exercises his will through his words that he spoke while on earth. The father decreed that his son would exercise this authority through his words when at the transfiguration he thundered from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Matthew chapter 17 verse 5. And then the Hebrews writer begins that majestic book with these words. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers through the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us through or by or in his son, whichever version you're reading, Hebrews 1 and verse 1. This means the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament, the authority of which ceased at Calvary in Colossians 2 verse 14 as we read. Those who try to combine parts of the Old Testament with parts of the New Testament produce man-made churches. God no more gave the law of Moses to govern men since the cross than he gave the law of Christ to govern men before the cross. We shall never hear the powerful and gracious words as they fell from the lips of our Lord on this earth. 
But in God's providence, he arranged for a written record of those very words to come down to our very day. And that will be preserved until the last day. Upon the matchless authority of Jesus, his disciples are under his mandate to proclaim those words collectively called the gospel, the word, the faith, the New Testament, even unto the end of the world, as we've noticed. Matthew 28 and verse 20. The stress on the authority of his word is unmistakable when he says, If ye love me, ye will keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15. And then he turned it around. He that loveth me not keepeth not my words. Verse 24. His words will be the standard of judgment at last for all of those who have lived since he died on the old rugged cross. In John 12, 48, he said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my sayings, or my words, the King James says, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Jesus also exercises his authority through the words of others whom he selected and qualified as his spokesmen principally the apostles. To these men he promised that upon his return to the Father, he would send upon them the Holy Spirit, who when he has come will guide you into all the truth. John chapter 16 verse 13. These men and a very few others of the first century saints were given the ability to know the will of God through the revelation of the Spirit. And they wrote those words down. First they spoke the words that were revealed to them. Then they wrote the words giving us our New Testaments. Thus that which Paul and the other New Testament penmen wrote is just as authoritative as the words that our Lord spoke. Don't let a red letter version of the New Testament lead you astray with the impression that that's the only thing that matters, just the red letters. They're all red letters if they're in the New Testament. They're all authoritative by the Lord's own uh, command and arrangement. The exertion of his authority through the New Testament alone excludes all extra-biblical sources. The Holy Spirit has not revealed any additional truth since John laid his inspired pen aside on the island of Patmos. All of the denominations claiming affinity with Christ profess to honor the Bible However, they all accept additional authorities besides the Bible. Which additional authorities make them distinct denominations, both one from another and from the Lord's church? The Roman Catholic Church relies upon the traditions of the fathers plus the ex-cathedra rulings of the councils and the popes. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has its Book of Mormon, which it calls another New Testament. The Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and the Covenants, besides its President and Apostles. The United Methodist Church has its Book of Discipline, plus its annual conferences. The Presbyterian Church USA has its Constitution, the backbone of which is the 1647 uh, Scottish Westminster Confession of Faith, plus its annual synods. The Baptist churches have their Baptist Standard Manual by Hiscox, plus their annual conventions, and on and on we could go. It's always a plus, a plus, a plus, something besides, in addition to the New Testament. Every attempt to make the Lord share some of his absolute authority, executed solely through the New Testament, with any other authority source, will invariably result in a church of man or men rather than the church of Christ. Herein lies a principal difference between the Lord's church and all religious orders of men. Faithfulness to Christ demands absolute respect for Jesus' absolute authority as exercised exclusively through his word, the New Testament. Principle number three. Recognition that obedience to the New Testament plan of salvation is the only means of becoming a member of the Lord's church. I know that sounds simple to us, but it is unknown by a multiplied millions of people. They do not get the concept. Inspiration inseparably intertwines salvation and the church Jesus built. 
He began on Pentecost, adding to his church those who are saved and has not ceased doing so day by day. Acts 2 verse 47. His church is the depository of saved people. He will save the body, which is his church, Ephesians 5, 23 and 1, 22, 23. At his coming, he will deliver up the kingdom, which is his church, to God, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Men are redeemed, forgiven of sins, saved by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 1, 7, which explains Paul's declaration that the Lord purchased the church, that is, those who are saved. With his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. If Christ will save only his church, and if he adds one to his church only at the point at which one is saved, forgiven of his sins by the blood of Christ, then the most profound and far-reaching questions of all time are, what must I do to be saved? Or how may I become a member of the Lord's church? Which are actually one and the same question. Directly contradicting the foregoing scriptural evidence is a fundamental misconception held by practically all of the denominations. That is, salvation and church membership are entirely separate matters, realized at separate times and upon separate actions. One is saved at point A. He becomes a member of a church, if he chooses, at point B. The Roman Catholic and Mormon churches are Exceptions to this, they teach church membership and salvation are uh, entwined with each other. They are inseparable. But they corrupt the principle both of the church and of the plan of salvation. So they ruin it anyway. What did those sinners on Pentecost do so that Luke, the inspired historian, could pronounce them saved? Having learned this, we shall at the same time learn the means of their becoming members of the Lord's church. We shall also at once learn when men, what men must do from that time forward to be saved and to be added to his church. The Lord's day by day adding will not cease until time is no more. Again, Matthew 28, verse 20. The thrust of the first part of Peter's sermon on Pentecost was aimed at convincing unbelieving Jews, many of whom had cried for Jesus' blood just 50 days earlier, that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, as we noted earlier in Acts 2.36. The explanation of the astounding Pentecost events, the application of prophecy, and the eyewitness testimony stirred heartfelt conviction in some, causing them to interrupt Peter's sermon. I wish somebody would interrupt my sermon sometime with this question. What shall we do? That's what they said, verse 37. Well, this is actually an elliptical question. If we had the full statement of what they're asking, it would be something like this. What shall we do to be forgiven of this heinous crime or sin? Their question was tantamount to a confession of their faith in the one Peter had set before them as both Lord and Christ. I haven't heard of an infidel here lately saying, what shall I do to be saved? Peter's inspired answer is crucial. Completing heaven's universal age-enduring plan whereby alien sinners may be forgiven, redeemed, and saved. It was this. Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, by his authority unto the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 38. Peter continued preaching and exhorted them with many other words, verse 40 tells us. And then verse 41 tells us that those hearers who were glad to receive that message did not hesitate, but were baptized, upon which the Lord added them unto them. About 3,000 of them. And then verse 47 completes the chapter, they were added to the church by the Lord day by day as they were saved. So let's briefly analyze, analyze and summarize. First, Peter commanded confessing believers to repent, that is, turn in mind and deed of their sins. Second, Peter told confessing penitent believers to be baptized, that is, immersed in water. Third, Peter explicitly stated 
that the end of their baptism was unto remission of your sins. He obviously thought it necessary for them to understand the purpose of the act, as we also must. For Peter issued these commands not upon his own authority, but in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority. Standing in stark contrast with the foregoing record are the answers that men in their man-made churches have been giving to what must I do or what shall we do for centuries. Common answers include pray the sinner's prayer, invite Jesus into your heart, or just believe in Jesus and he will save you. With few exceptions, Protestantism subscribes to Martin Luther's 16th century sola fide, meaning solely by faith, dictum. One is saved by faith alone at the time he intellectually accepts the truth that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, is what they're teaching. This dogma rules out any human works, as they call them, or actions whatsoever, with baptism as its specific target, no doubt. The sinner thus pronounced saved upon mere, mere faith may or may not be admitted to a church upon profession of that faith, depending upon the denomination. The faith only no works doctrine not only contradicts scripture, it also contradicts itself. How shall others know one believes in Christ without his telling them so? Is not a confession a work with the mouth? And Paul makes a distinction between belief in the heart and confession with the mouth in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. For that matter, Jesus said that belief in him is the work of God, that is the work ordained of God, John 6, verses 28 and 29. If salvation is apart from any and all human activity, faith itself is thereby eliminated. Ironically, in separating salvation from church membership, the denominations do so correctly with regard to all of their churches. The Lord has never added any person to a denomination. One who obeys the Lord's plan of salvation will never be in a denomination unless he joins it and remains in it because of apostasy. Since God and his son had no part in building any of these institutions of men, there is no salvation in any of them. I know that many of us, maybe all of us, have loved ones, friends, dear ones who are members of denominations. They are lost, my brethren and friends. Jesus left no doubt about the tragic end of all such institutions. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Matthew 15, verse 13. Simply and plainly put, one cannot listen to these words. One cannot be saved without being a member of the church of Christ. Amen. Now it's also true, one cannot be a member of the church of Christ without being saved. The only means of being saved is by obedience to the plan of salvation first heralded in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago, which all of the denominations despise and disallow. Thus, not only may men be members of the church of Christ to be saved, they must be members of the church of Christ to be saved. Membership in the Lord's church and those who are saved are equivalent terms. Herein lies a clear distinction then between the church of the Lord and all the religions of men. And woe be unto that person who would dare blur this distinction as so many even among those claiming to be the Lord's people have done and continue to do. Faithfulness demands recognition of the fact that salvation and membership in the Lord's church are inseparable. Principle number four. Recognition that the Lord's church possesses unique characteristics by which it may be identified. Every religious institution has its peculiar characteristics that make it distinct and distinguishable from all others. Otherwise, they'd all be the same. These include such things as their organizational structures, their worship activities and practices, their membership requirements, and other such things. One of the most obvious of these differences is the name a group chooses, which may relate to a founder such as the Lutheran Church, 
or a practice, the Baptist church, or some kind of church government or polity, such as the Presbyterian or Episcopalian church, or an event, the Pentecostal church, or a geographical location, the Church of England, and on and on. You can go with the list. What is true regarding these traits of identity of the institutions of men is no less true of the Lord's church. It's utter folly to deny the premise that there are characteristics that identify the church of the Lord and set it apart from all other religious institutions. In the face of those liberals who have expressed remorse that they ever emphasize these identifying marks and promise they'll never do it again, I stress the necessity of never ceasing to emphasize these marks. Only by recognizing what they are can one distinguish the divine institution from all others. Only by recognizing what they are can we be the Lord's church. This distinction is the very thing that liberals despise, for it hinders their goal of carrying the church into the fullness of denominationalism. They neither believe in the necessity nor the possibility of maintaining the church in its primitive purity. One can as well identify and locate a stolen car without knowing such things as its color and its make and the year it was manufactured and maybe the license plate and the body style and so forth without knowing those characteristics you'll never find the car. The New Testament writers reveal that one can know and must know the identifying characteristics of the church which we learn of in the book of Acts and the epistles. The Lord described his church according to his own infallible plan and he so established it. It flowed from God's eternal purpose, Acts, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. God gave Moses a pattern for the tabernacle of old. Exodus 25 and verse 40 said, For see that thou make all things according to the pattern that was shown thee in the mount. New Testament writers picked that up, at least a speaker and a writer did. Stephen included it in his great sermon in Acts chapter 7. And then Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. In contrasting the Old Testament with the New Testament, the way of Moses with the way of Christ. He quoted this passage, but he was not saying we should build a tabernacle today. The application was that we must be as concerned about the pattern for the new as Moses was instructed to be about the old. And so Christ is the minister of a better covenant enacted upon better promises. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 says, The Lord intends for us to keep his pattern intact. We obviously don't have time to go through that pattern. You're going to have to read the book. We'll simply say that the church worshipped in a certain way, and we have no right to change that. The day of worship was the Lord's day, as several passages indicate. On each Lord's day, they were to eat the unleavened bread and partake of the fruit of the vine in memory of the death of our Lord. They were to give as they had been prospered to finance the work of each local congregation. They were to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs of praise unto God and of edification toward one another. They were to address the Father in heaven through his Son, Jesus Christ, in prayer. And they were to study together the Word of God under the leadership of someone who had been chosen for that purpose. Those are identifying characteristics of worship. New Testament was organized. New Testament church was organized in a certain way. The denominations have the concept of the church as an invisible entity with all of the denominations making this invisible church up. And of course the New Testament concept is that there is the visible entity of a universal church comprised of all of the individual congregations of that one church. There is a distinctive characteristic of the Lord's church in that, and it is a very important one. It keeps the Lord's church from having a headquarters on earth, a hierarchy on earth, and it keeps us with local congregational government under qualified elders in each congregation where such men can be found. And deacons assisting them also required to meet New Testament qualifications. Men are not content to submit to the authority of Christ, and so they've changed all of these things in a thousand different ways. 
we must understand these characteristics and we must abide by these characteristic marks of the Lord's church. Just a few words on point number five. And that is recognition that the foremost task of the church is spiritual in nature. Someone says, uh, didn't the Lord come to uh, heal the sick? Didn't he come to just relieve human misery? The answer to that is no. He could have stayed in heaven and done that. He had been doing that for a long time through his servants. He had even raised the dead through his prophets of old. He could have continued doing that through his apostles and through others that he gave the power to do that to. He came to do something no other one could do. When we read earlier from John chapter 20, 30 and 31, John saying, Many other signs therefore did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you might have life in his name by believing. We have there the indication of why Jesus came. But hear his own words to Zacchaeus. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke 19 verse 10. Paul understood that. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's it. Now does that mean he really didn't have any compassion on all of those that he healed? And there were thousands that were affected by his miracles. Oh no, no one was more compassionate than he. But again, he came to heal a disease and illness that was far worse than leprosy or palsy or any of the other ills that he did heal of men physically. And no one else could heal those ills. He came to heal the sickness of sin. The denominations of this world have their sights set on this world. Few of them indeed have their sights set on the world beyond and living in such a way that we can be there someday. So many of the denominations are big business enterprises. And we could get into all of the TV charlatans and the churches that they have started and that they perpetuate on the backs of naive and gullible people. The Lord's church is none of those things. The Lord's church has one signal responsibility and it's summed up three times in the Lord's words. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, and Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. It is to take the saving gospel into all the world. It does not mean the church should not have compassion on the helpless. We should help the helpless as we have opportunity and ability. Do good unto all men, especially unto those who are the household of faith. We must never forget that. But even in that, there is to be an overriding aim of meeting spiritual needs of those that we help. Isn't that what the Lord meant in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 16 when he said, So let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And surely we must edify one another. But again, the end of our edification is to build us up so that we are in a better position to take the gospel to the lost. If we, as the Lord's church, do not take the gospel to the lost, tell me who's going to take it. Who else is going to preach the gospel? Nobody will if we don't. And so the Lord's great work in his physical body comes across to the Lord's great work for his spiritual body, which is the church. Let us ever keep that number one, and we won't have to worry about building gymnasiums and having raffles and getting into the real estate business, buying hotels and things of that kind, as is so common among denominational groups. Thank you so much for listening. I wish I had another hour, but I know I've already run over. Well, we're certainly indebted to Brother McLeish for that great lesson. And there's so many places in the Church of Christ to where those things and virtually each topic, each point could be developed into one or more sermons. They're just not preached as they were at one time. Um, people don't like the idea of New Testament identifying marks of the church. Brother Buddy and sometimes comments on this. I've said it many times here. It's a strange thing to me that people who claim to love the Lord cannot find the Lord's church. 
And when the identifying marks are there, the enemies of the Lord's people were always able to find the Lord's church when they wanted to persecute them. Now, I wonder if they knew there were certain identifying marks that made a Christian stand out from everybody else. Certainly they did. And so um, we are indebted to you, and thank you so much for that material. We've got um, just a few minutes, uh, four or five minutes, so let's not go far. We'll be coming back for our last uh, session of the evening. Thank you.